Well, Basim. Piers. It's good to see you. It's good to see you too. Um, last time, obviously, we did it remotely. Yes. You were here. I was in London. And you complained that it was an unfair <laughs> situation. You couldn't see me. Your earpiece kept falling out. Yes. So I thought, OK, fair enough. I hear you. I got on a plane. I flew six and a half thousand miles. And not only that, we're doing it in somewhere that is very familiar to you. It's the comedy store in Los Angeles where you performed many times as a stand-up. So I've done my bit. You did. You did. But actually, this is not, this is not the first time we meet in person. No, no. We yeah. did originally in, we did. in London last year. And I know that many people are watching this for the first time. Mm. I don't know, but like, I would really love to tell the story of that moment because yes. uh, I was uh, having a, a, a tour in the UK and Europe and I was doing my English stand-up. Mm. And one of my, uh, you know, advertising promotion plan was to come on your show. So my agent called me, it's like, Bessim, you're going to be on Piers Morgan. I said, damn, it's like, what's wrong? It's like, well, uh, Piers Morgan blocked me on Twitter. <laughs> I did. And, and he said, like, what did you do? I said, well, during January 6th, you know, the insurrection, you know, uh, you tweeted something about it. And I was so angry at what's happening. And I remember you having you and Donald Trump in a picture. And I said, said the guy who had Donald Trump with him, whatever. <laughs> and, and, and then I, 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 I used, like, very harsh words. And, of course, you blocked me. So I, and then I said, like, does he know? I don't know. Does he know? I don't know. Does he know? I don't know. So I walked into the studio. And the moment I was like being seated and they're preparing before we go on air, and you say, like, "Oh, hi, Basim. It seems that you have more followers than me, but it seems that I blocked you. Why?" <laughs> like, oh, and I told you, and then we we said the story on air, and it was funny because I made the joke. I was like, "You have always been standing against cancel culture, yeah. and you just canceled me on Twitter." But we agreed that this is not canceling because this is your own space and you're free. But now you're unblocked me, and we and are. We're, and, and we're, we're here. And um, we're here. And it was yeah. And actually, we agreed about January the sixth. By the way, just yes. for the record. Yeah, yeah, um, the I was done about you. Maybe you weren't surprised. I was completely staggered by the response globally to our interview several weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Were you taken aback by the scale of it? Uh, yes, of course, but I understand why. Um, for many years, the media covering the Middle East has uh, been um, showing a certain point of view. I'm not going to say bias, but I would say it did not allow certain voices, certain um, voices from the other side to be heard. And that is why you see the frustration. You all, whenever you speak to people in the Middle East, they tell you the same thing. Uh, they, 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 they are not very happy with the, the coverage of the Middle East because our voices are not heard. Now, I am the least qualified person ever to talk about this conflict. And yet, just because I relate some of the talking points that we say and we hear the whole time, mm -hmm. people felt heard. And when, you, when, when people have this feeling, they, they, they're happy. They, are, they, 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 they have this response. They say, like, oh my god, for the, for the first time, the West are actually hearing our point of view. Some of the point of view might not be, go well with other people, but at least we have a conversation. And I think that is the reason why people reacted that way. Uh, yeah. It's, it's such an incendiary subject matter. I've never seen social media so ablaze with hostility on, on both sides. Did you actually, as well as enormous praise from the Arab world, did you also get criticized by some parts of the Arab world for not going perhaps oh, hard enough? Oh, you didn't do that, you didn't do that. Right. The thing is, this is like, uh, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Right. If you don't speak up, why don't you speak up? If you speak up, you didn't speak up enough. If you're done, why are you do If you speak up too much, oh, you're taking all the attention on you. And I, lo I love that fact because people always who accuse people of being the center of attention, they are actually not very happy that the attention is not on them. This is actually like a rule on social media. But yeah, there was a backlash, but there was also a backlash from the other side, which uh, I, I mean, here mm. and other comedy clubs, I worked with people from all kinds of different backgrounds, mm. uh, Jewish, Christians, Muslims, Arabs, atheists, all kinds of people. And there are a lot of people who went to my socials like, oh, so you're a terrorist sympathizer now, you know? And uh, I think it is important to have uh, a nuanced, deep, interesting, intelligent conversation. A lot of people waiting for this mm. are kind of like, yeah, Basim, bury Pierce, mm. show him. And this is the problem with the news today. The problem is the news today, it's not about the news anymore. Mm. It's about the people giving you the news. Mm. So it becomes a show, a circus. Two gladiators in the Colosseum. Two pigs fighting in the mud. And this is why 
people don't get anything out of it. It's a circus. You know, one of the things I heard a lot was, who is this guy? And they weren't talking about me. Sometimes, <laughs> I, sometimes I wonder. <laughs> now, obviously, you're very, very well known in the Arab world. You're known as the kind of, they called you the Arab John Stewart, and you're well known in America, but you weren't that well known, for example, in the UK. Mm. Uh, and I think what this interview did, it, it made a lot of people think, wow, all right, this, this is incredible, mm. but tell me more about Bassam Yusuf. And I, I did a bit of research into your life, and it is a fascinating journey that you've gone on to get here mm. to Los Angeles. And I think it's worth just taking a little beat here to talk about this, because you began in Cairo as a heart surgeon. I mean, yeah. that was your career path. Yes. And, yes. you, and you were a heart surgeon. I was a heart surgeon until, yeah. Uh, I, I spent 19 years in that career, seven years in medical school, 12 years as a practicing doctor. And uh, 2011 happened, and the revolution happened, and I had my own show on YouTube. I did like a small vi videos. Well, I'm going to come to this because yeah. I was in, I, by coincidence, I had just joined CNN to replace the great Larry yes. King. And I hadn't actually done any live show. I'd done a few weeks since I joined of taped interviews with big names, Donald Trump, Oprah Winfrey, things like that. And I was flying back to Los Angeles when I got a message that Egypt was going up in the start of the Arab Spring. And I actually went to a studio very near here, about a mile down the road on Sunset, the CNN studio, the old Larry King studio. And I went live for the first time, and it was about the Arab Spring, and it was about what was happening in Egypt. And at the same time, you, in Egypt, were actually in Tahrir Square, helping wounded protesters, actually medically treating them. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, this was a kind of movement that inspired a lot of Egyptians. Um, at the time, I was, you know, I was in the hospital, and a, a lot of people just had volunteered. Oh. And the, the nurses were just like giving us like supplies, go, 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 and we were going there. And we were basically tending to the wounded because it is, and, and it kind of gives you a different perspective when you see helpless, defenseless people who, do, who are not armed who are being beaten by security forces, military forces, being shot, being, uh, you know, hurt. And uh, all you can do is just, like, provide some medical attention. And it kind of gives you a perspective to see how humanity sometimes can show its most ugly face. And the suppression of free speech, freedom yeah. of expression. Yeah. The ability of people to say what they honestly feel about a situation. Yes. And the suppression of people's basic rights to freedom. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, that kind of like uh, taught me a lot and, uh, and inspired me to do the show. But, you know... Well, you start, it's a crazy story, this. And I, I want to tell it because you just decide to do <laughs> five-minute stuff on YouTube. Yeah. And you're expecting a few people to watch yeah. it. And then, literally, it just flies. And suddenly, right. you're getting millions of people watching this. And very quickly, one of the big networks comes in. Mm. And then you're suddenly doing this stuff to 30 to 40 million people. Yeah. Like a third of the entire population of Egypt yeah. is tuning in to watch it. You're the biggest star of Egyptian television. Oh, please. But you were. Don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it, I mean, what an extraordinary thing, though, for a heart surgeon yeah. to go from helping protesters medically in Tahrir Square, the start yeah. of the Arab Spring, to within a year, you're the biggest star on Egyptian television. It's, it's a crazy it thing. Do, it, it doesn't sound as glamorous as this. It's, I, it, feels, it, it felt horrible. Did it? Why? Oh, yeah. Uh, overnight fame, this Scary. size, it's toxic. Mm. Terrible. Terrible. It, 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 it corrupts. It, 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 it uh, goes into your soul, and it, it's not good. It's not, I, I actually didn't enjoy it. Uh, and the worst, the, the worst part about it is that like, you're trying to do comedy in very controversial climate about very controversial issues. Mm -hmm. So you'll never, never satisfy people. And the problem is that you're, people have these expectations. Oh, if you are successful in this, you must be successful at solving mm -hmm. this. And when things are not solved because politics, as you know, very difficult to solve, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 that expectation, this love turns into hate. And, 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 this is, uh, and this is one of many, many reasons that like, I had to leave and I, and I came here eventually. Well, I wanna, let's just take people through what happened, because yes. they probably don't know a lot of people. So during the presidency of Mohamed Morsi, who was a democratically elected Islamist, mm. you, you had relative freedom to start, but then the more you went after government propaganda, the more you stood up for the people against the government, then the trouble started. Morsi wanted to shut you up. You eventually get dragged through the courts. 
I, I, I was arrested. I was arrested for one day. It was a warrant for my arrest, and then I turned myself in, and I was interrogated. And it was the funniest interrogation ever. And in my stand-up shows, I, I, I talk about that scene. Because the guards were reading the stuff out and laughing, right? Well, the guards were taking selfies with me, which is funny. Right. <laughs> and and, the, uh, and, the, and it, the exchange between me and the inter and persecutor, a uh, general persecutor, was extremely funny. I mean, I don't like to victimize myself. I don't like, oh, look at that. I actually like to find humor. But why were the... you arrested? What was the criteria? Oh, yeah. The, I, I think the list was insulting Islam insulting the president, spreading false rumors, and disrupting the fabric of society. And, uh, and uh, it was, I think the people in the room didn't know what to do with me, mm. because they ended up discussing my jokes. So it turned into a writer's room. And I, I was kind of like, how do you think we make this funnier? And it was the funniest exchange ever. And after six hours, I, I was let go. Mm. And uh, Was it scary, though, at the same time, that suddenly the machinery was getting a grip of you because it was to get a lot scarier. But was it in that moment when you first got arrested, you thought, I'm being arrested for breaching my freedom of speech, right? It, for some reason, I, I, I just like went with the flow. I went to the interrogation wearing the big hat. I went to the show. It, it, was, it was just, I, I just wanted this to be a farce mm. because I, I just like, you, you really, coming after the comedian and, and it was it I, I just tried to enjoy myself but deep inside I was dying <laughs> well you actually it, it gets serious enough where you may have died because actually <laughs> Morsi gets of course deposed in comes a general El Sisi in a coup a military coup and he doesn't find satire a laughing matter particularly when the jokes are about him you get blocked they literally block your show from airing I aired one episode, and it's interesting. This is, this is a very interesting story because the first episode that was aired after the removal of the Muslim Brotherhood, everybody was waiting to see what I would say. Because by that time, all of the Islamic channels that were, I mean, like me and me and Islamic channels, like it's like they had five channels and they were like me and them going like that. They, they had like five channels that have only one hour a week. And then they were removed. And then a lot of the other dissident voices were also being shut down. Now, our people are waiting. What will Basim say? Mm. And on the day that the show aired, the next day I went, I went out, and everybody's like, "Good, good. At least somebody is speaking." It was a very controversial episode. Nobody liked it, and yet everybody liked it because people said, "Like you're supporting the coup." No, you're the Muslim Brotherhood. Everybody accused me of something. All I did in that episode was just being a mirror of what is happening in the street and showing them how ridiculous it is. You didn't take a fixed position. Well, my position, depending on where, where, what's your position? What did you intend your position? My, my position was to show the ridiculousness of <clears throat> how the pe people now was like, oh, we got rid of Islamic fascism, but we are heading towards another fascism. Mm. Uh, there was, and there was a song that I did that was very controversial. People, and it's very funny, the, the pro-Muslim Brotherhood thought that this is a disrespect to the people who died. And on the other side, the people said that this is a disrespect to the army. And when you manage to offend everybody, you know you're right. Yes. And then the people in the middle is like, oh, you weren't, you weren't tough enough. And yeah. I was told, it's like, why didn't you go after? The, 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 free, the ceiling of freedom just went down. And I was just like, it was very difficult. It is very difficult to go against pa uh, an, uh, an authority that is very that was very popular at the time, and especially a military authority with oh, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of experience. Oh yeah, of weaponizing these situations. Yeah, you had death threats. People would always choose most of the time. They would always choose the military form rather than the religious form because mm. they they kind of like uh, at least they are not infringing on my personal freedom. Not yet, but uh, you had threats on your life, didn't you? Oh, all the time. I don't talk about that because like I have been having death threats like. They never stopped since 2011. They never stopped. Have they continued since our last interview? Oh, yeah. They never stopped. People threatening to kill you? All the time. Wh why? For what reason? Oh, uh, for just saying something that they don't like. Oh, because you, you are against uh, Egypt, you're against Islam, you're against our president, you're mm -hmm. against God. It, it never stops. It never stops. It doesn't, yeah. doesn't bother you? I mean, if you die, you die. You know? If you die, you die. I mean, since, since when, whatever, like, <laughs> nobody guards deflected a, uh, a bullet, you know, uh, maybe, 
the guy who would Ronald Reagan. But <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I think it's like whatever, even like at a certain point, I actually had like private security. Mm. And then I told him, I can't, I, I cannot live like that. Mm. If, if that's my destiny, if I die, I'll just die. You end up with your lawyer saying, you've got to get out of it. You've got to get out of Egypt. It's yeah. getting too dangerous. Yeah. Something bad's going to happen. You're going to yeah. get arrested again and probably sung in jail or you're going to, he's going to try and kill you. And you flee to Dubai mm -hmm. and then you end up here yeah. in America. Yes. Was that always the plan to eventually come to America or was it expediency because of what happened? Well, it's funny that you said that because I visited the United States after the first year of my show. Mm. And uh, um, a doctor that's there, an Egyptian doctor has been there for, for a while. I said, listen, Bessim, you, you are very visible in the media and I think you can use that to apply for a green card as a special talent. And I did. And it's like, I, I, I have like a huge show in It's Egypt. actually the criteria, because I have the same, yeah. is uh, a, an alien of exceptional ability. Yes. Is what they call you. Yes, we're very, Charmingly. Yes, we're very we're exceptional. exceptionally able aliens. We are, but we're still aliens. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know, it always makes me laugh. <laughs> yeah. like, you can come here, but you are uh, an alien. An alien, but you're exceptional. Yeah. And uh, I, um, I just I, I applied for it, and I got it. Uh, I got the Time 100 that helped both from my... Uh, my application, and said, ah, maybe I'm not going to use it. And then when that happens, ooh, that green card came handy. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people think that I'm here on asylum. I'm not. I just, it was just a, a, a strike of luck. You now do stand up. Mm -hmm. and you've done it for five years. And fascinatingly, you do some of it for an Arab audience. You have a whole show in Arabic. And, a, and an English-speaking yes. version. Yes. And they're probably very different, right? Totally because different. Different sensibilities, different humor, yeah. different crowds, yes. different expectations. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, when the uh, Arab audience come to my show, they expect that it's going to be another version of my show that I did in Egypt. And I said, no, it's a my personal story. And if, when the Arabs look, uh, to come to my English shows, like they think it's like an English version of the, Arab, of the show. It's like, no, it's a different story. Even then, this weekend, right before I met you, because of our interview, I sold out Arizona. Really? <laughs> yes. And I, and, I, and I stood, and the first thing I said, like, who here came because of the Piers Morgan show? I was like, ah! I was like, I was like boy, you're going to be disappointed <laughs> because this is not about that. But isn't that amazing? I mean, yeah. that shows the power of that interview. Yeah. Resonating even in, in Arizona here. Amazing. Yeah, because I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to succeed just because of a trending moment of time. Mm. It is the sh same show that I've been working and perfecting. Mm. And like any stand-up comedian in the United States, your dream is what? Is to sell you special to mm. platforms like Netflix or HBO. And you, you want to get there. Because for me, that was like a, uh, like a, re like a rebirth. Mm. Because I thought like everything was lost. I came here, I had nothing. Uh, uh, the first three, four years, uh, it was terrible. the first two years I was doing stand-up, oh, I bombed hard. I bombed hard and I, I went home crying. I said, like, I'm not going to make it. And then suddenly I have already a tour. I mean, even before our show, I already had a set tour. Mm. And now I'm having like this ability of like talking to people with different languages, talking to all these different languages. The show that I did in Arizona had an incredible mix of Arabs and Americans. Nice. And they came here and they completely, for, and there, a lot of them came, they were Palestinians. Mm. And they came with like the Palestinian flags and the cafe. And I thought, it's like, guys, it's like the way. Uh, Laughter, being good at your job, in, is in, in its way a, a way of resistance. Because when you laugh, when you, tell, when you show people that, hey, we have Arab people here, and they are, by the Arabs and Palestinians population, Arizona, one of the most established population in the United States. Arabs in the United States in general, mm. they are like professionals, doctors, engineers, mm. professors. Even the Uber drivers, they are probably were like an engineer or mm. someone very established there, but he had to have like a step down in order to come here and survive. Mm. So, uh, well, I mean, we don't, we, we, we hardly come find like illegal aliens here from or people that like came in that were not qualified. So the, and this is the problem of, this is why the reason people were very happy of our interview because, for, for, because part of the hate on both sides is that we see the news from a different perspective. Mm. And people here see the news from another perspective. And everybody's like, why are those people reacting like this? Mm. Because they don't see what the other person sees. And I hope in that interview that we can bridge that gap. Yes. Before, so before we, can I, can I, can yes. I show? Uh, okay, so this is a gift from me and my wife. <laughs> this is uh, olive oil from the West Bank. Huh? Whenever you go to, I go to Jordan a lot, mm. but my wife also like, ask for the oil from the West Bank. It's, it's very good. Uh, oh, 
It is the best oil ever. And the thing is, the olive trees, they, they you know they survive up to 600 years. Mm -hmm. And they are passed from one generation to the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it is like a family heritage. And the way that you do it, so this is zaatar. Mm -hmm. Zaatar is basically thyme, and you add to it sesame and a bunch of herbs. And the way that you eat that, you take like a piece of bread. Mm -hmm. We don't have to do it now, maybe at the end of the interview. Yeah. And you basically, you soak it a little bit in the oil, yeah. and then you take the zaatar. And I'm, I'll demonstrate here. Chuk, chuk, chuk. And then pretty, pretty. And then here. I love you it. Love well, it. I love Arabic food. So I'll, you're at living, the end of the interview, you're leaving with this oil. So I will yours. take that. It's and, yours. That, well, yeah. thank you. And it's very kind of your no. wife. Thank you. No. Thank you very much for me. Well, I'm down to bought it, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you started the last interview with, I mean, I would argue, savagely dark humour involving your wife. Mm -hmm. How you've been trying to kill her, and she was using your kids as human shields and stuff. And I, I'll be honest and with you. I'm still you. trying to. <laughs> but I. But you know what? When I failed, you know what I did. Mm. I went out to the house and I just like randomly slapped other neighbors. So you know, it's interesting. When, by mistake. Now this time I'm ready for you, okay? This time I'm ready for the humor. <laughs> oh, you're ready, okay. No, but it's interesting because last time I was very taken aback. <laughs> and I remember thinking as you were doing this at the, right off the top, I remember feeling very uncomfortable, unusually uncomfortable, and thinking I didn't know how to react to that. I didn't know whether I was supposed to laugh or be silent or, and I sort of ended up sort of slightly grimacing, half laugh and listening. And then I realized it was very powerful what you were doing. It was satirical, but it was savagely satirical and extremely effective. And that's why I think the interview did so well. But I'm not going to pretend that I found it easy <coughs> to listen to it or to react to it, because I didn't. You know why? Because all I did was just take the talking points that's been in the media, mm. not just for mm. after October 7th, all through the conflict. It's always like, we need to kill it, all right. You need to kill five? No, kill ten. You need to kill some? No, kill all. This is what satire does. You take, uh, take reality, flip it on its head, exaggerate it, and then you can see how sometimes very uncomfortable and even sometimes stupid that sounds. Mm. Because I, I, I was just reacting to whatever the media is telling me. It's like, oh, yeah, okay, okay let's do it. Go, mm. um, there's no pushback. So suddenly, the person who was proposing the most extreme measures, like, oh, we're taking, oh, no, 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 that's too much. So that, that was like a very simple technique. I just talk, took the talking point and just exaggerated it. Was, it was devastatingly effective, I yeah. think. Um, first, before we go any further, how is your wife's family? Because she is half Palestinian. Yeah. Are they okay? Are no, they... They're, they're good. They're good. They are safe for now. Yeah. Um, in as like the last week, there was no internet, as you have. Yes. You know, I, I saw you tweet at the IDF. It's like, how can they know? You if know they, how many uh, views that tweets? That nearly 40 million. Yeah. Me just saying, how are they going to see this message if you've cut the yeah. internet? Off? Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if the IDF's like, why aren't the Palestinians liking my tweet? Because they don't see it. Right. <laughs> no, but I thought that was a perfectly yeah. correct yeah. assessment of it. Yeah. Um, but the reaction to that tweet I did was enormous, as everything is in this, mm. in this thing. And I had a lot of people say, finally, Piers, you get it, right? Finally, you get it. And, and I wanted to say, listen, I'm, I'm trying to reach a place where I get this, but mm -hmm. it's an incredibly complicated issue mm -hmm. for someone who is not Arabic or Jewish to poke their head into. And I've had to cover it as a journalist for a long, long time. I think I said to you before that I was editor of a Daily Mirror in England when we opposed the Iraq war, for example. So, you know, I have taken stands on this thing. On this one, I find, and I'm going to be completely straight with you, I discussed this with Jordan Peterson um, mm. this week, and he did a pretty incendiary tweet in which he said, give them hell, Netanyahu, enough is enough. And he was actually very self-reflective about that in the interview we did this week, where he later issued a 20-minute video, because he said sometimes a, a one-line tweet can be unnecessarily inflammatory to people. Much better to take time to explain it. Here's, here's where I've got to with this conflict now. I viewed what happened on October the 7th as a, an absolutely appalling atrocity, a terror attack of unimaginable horror. And I absolutely think that Israel has a right to defend itself from the people who committed it en masse. And I've questioned for the last three, four weeks what is a proportionate response? And I have said repeatedly, I don't know the answer. I want people who have a view to have a view about that. And I'll ask you a 
again, about where you think we are with this. I also acknowledge that Hamas live amongst civilian population in Gaza, and therefore if you do what the Israelis are currently doing, which is a ground offensive into Gaza, a lot of civilians are going to get killed. And at what point does that become disproportionate or even illegal? And I don't know the answers to those questions. And I have a moral quandary because my instinct is to say that Israel has no choice but to respond to what happened in a very forceful manner. I understand why they want to eliminate Hamas altogether. I understand that if they feel they can, then perhaps we can move to a, a, a two-state solution or peace or whatever it may be, although I don't think Netanyahu will ever be the person to do that. But the, the moral question for me is at what point does this become disproportionate? And when you see thousands of children being killed in Gaza, it fills me with utter horror. And then people say, well, do you condemn it? And I find it very easy to condemn Israel turning off the water, Israel turning off the power. I think it's ridiculous that Israel should have that power over millions of people who are not part of their country. I think it's terrible what's happening in the West Bank with the settlers. I think that the stuff there is completely easy to condemn. But can I hand on heart condemn Israel trying to destroy Hamas after what they did on October the 7th? That is where I'm struggling to find myself saying I condemn it. because. I believe that they are right to try and destroy Hamas. Now, what do you feel about my moral quandary? Well, there is there's a lot of points, very lot, and I think it, this is this will kind of like uh, lay the ground rules for that uh, interview. There is a whole thing about like is it right to defend itself, the condemnation. First of all, let's start with condemnation. Yes. You want my opinion? Yes. Condemning Hamas or condemning Israel? Yes. Completely useless. Mm. Completely useless. Why? You, I condemn Hamas, you condemn Israel, interview is over. What happened? Nothing. Mm. It is just checkpoints, like morality checkpoints. But I've interviewed a lot of pro-Palestinians, for example, some of whom will immediately say, I unreservedly condemn the terror attacks of October the 7th, mm -hmm. and then go on to criticize yeah. Israel. And I think that's a very, well, it's a position I can completely respect. Yeah. But I find it much harder to respect a pro-Palestinian guest on my show if they simply resolutely refuse to say yeah. that they can condemn the terror yeah. attacks. Yes. I find that less yeah. worthy of respect. But you see, this is the problem with the news. We go into the circular motion of the same as a, one thing that I have noticed, mm. not just on the coverage of these events, the, 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 the events before and before and before. Every time this starts, people say, we don't know what's happening. It's a very complicated situation. Right. What is happening now? And for me, as a viewer, if a conflict that's been there for 75 years and the media with all this technology has been covering it and we hear the same exact words, we don't know what's happening. It's complicated. It's a very complex. That is a failure of the media apparatus. That is the failure to themselves and for the audience because why every time this happens, it seems like it is happening from, from, from point zero. And I think to help understand that, I will get to the f October 7th. I will get to the condemnation. I will get to the self-defense. But I think maybe we can do, we, we have like all the time in the world, yeah. and we can discuss, this, could, this interview could be a bookmark, yeah. landmark, for maybe looking at that conflict yeah. in a deeper way that nobody had gone there before. Yeah. We have the views, we have people waiting, yes. you know, as I said, I'm the least qualified to discuss that, but... It's an opportunity not, to use listen, it. I'm not massively yeah, well qualified uh, uh, myself. Yeah, both of us. I'm like, a, I mean, I'm look Ar at us. I'm two, an Irish Catholic. I right? mean, look at us. Yeah, two privileged people. One white, one mm. one white, white wannabe, <laughs> discussing <laughs> discussing the, the the most complex conflict of mm. of our of our history. But I want to start in a totally different area. I want to start with anti-Semitism. Yes, I think it's an important issue. Yes, I think. There is a rise of anti-Semitism in the world. And I think there is, uh, this is very dangerous. And I, as a Muslim who has been through events where there were terrorist attacks somewhere, mm. and that reflects to us, on us, I, uh, I completely, uh, completely feel that. Uh, uh, since what happened, I had text messages from the Jewish friends. Are you okay? Are you, are your wife's family okay? And I was texting them, are you okay? Are you? And I think it is very important to agree on the language because the word anti-Semite 
has been used and abused and most most of the time not f on for the you know for the good in, um, interest of the mm -hmm. Jewish people because the first two days of the coverage I watched the news and I and there was a lot of um, protest that was led by Jewish Voice for Peace mm -hmm. and they were led by people who opposed the Israeli attack on the civilians and I remember quite well many of the Republican representatives in Congress came out and they were calling these the global intifada, the global jihad. I love it when they say jihad. They sound like a horse. Jihad. <laughs> it's very funny. Uh, or they, uh, they say, like, these are, and I quote, Iranian-backed jihadists. Mm -hmm. And I said, wait a minute, but most of those people are Jewish. Those people who took over the capital, the same people who took over Central Station in New York, which is known as the biggest civil disobedience event in America in the last two decades. They were all Jewish. And then I find Nikki Haley saying anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism. And then I remember it's like, oh, Jewish people in America are saddled by the fact that they are not citizens of America or citizens of the world, but they are citizens of Israel. And they have to back Israel in whatever they do. And these are not my words. These are the words of John Stewart. He went out and he said, and said like, and he said it's very, very important to divide these two. And what is very, very interesting... What, would you compare that on that specific point to the way that people try and say all Palestinians are responsible and accountable for oh, what Hamas do? Yes, uh, yeah. In other words, I think you can be very critical of Israeli government oh, and their policies yes. and Benjamin Netanyahu and the politicians, but that doesn't mean that you have to take that criticism to innocent Israelis who may have exactly the same criticism themselves. And this is why it is very important to have these kind of discussions, because it, it, the funniest, not the funniest, the saddest thing that I saw is the people that were in so much support of Israel mm. are anti-Semite themselves. MTG, MTG, MTG uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, mm. You know, she said like, oh, those are, I send my aides and they took pictures of the protesters. Basically, she's surveilling protesters. And uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene is very known for a very famous post in 2018 where she blamed the California wildfire uh, fires on a Jewish space laser gun. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? I was just like, oh, they were burned because Jewish investors, Rothschild and Finstein, anything was that ends with Stein, because that's of course sounds Jewish. They put a satellite and shooting laser beams to... It's, it's it's possible. And, and, and not just her. You have uh, Steve Scolalis. Uh, uh, Scolalis, uh, thank you so much. Uh, he is the, now the, the Speaker of the House, and he, he has been invited before in a, in a, in a, for an organization that was funded by David Duke, the founder of the KKK. You have Kevin McCarthy, who is the former minority speaker, uh, uh, leader of the Republican Party in the House, and he accused Jewish billionaires of rigging the midterm. So how come those people are accusing us of anti-Semites? So here's the thing. So go, let's go to the equation that Nikki Haley put on Twitter. Anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism. No, it is true. People who hate Jews, they're also anti-Zionists. It is true. And you could be someone who hate Zionists, who don't like Zionism, uh, and you are Semite, you could even be Jewish. Mm. And guess what? You could be a Zionist, like those people, uh, supporting Israel, and at the same time you hate the Jews, because the chant, Jews will not replace us, these echoed in Charlottesville. It did not echo in Gaza. I mean, in Gaza they say war stuff in, in between the bombing under downtime. But, and these are the same people who are seen with Nick Fuentes. With, uh, right. uh, with, with, well, with, with, with Stephen with Bannon. And you know what's Donald most Trump interesting? Had him for dinner yes. at and all of those people are buddies with Benjamin Netanyahu. Mm. So how does this work? Mm. How does this work? Mm. And you know the people who speak against this, like John Stewart, like Bernie Sanders, like uh, Naomi Klein? What do they call these people? What do they call them? Self-hating Jews. And you know what else they, now they call them? They call them Kapus. Mm. Kapus. You know what's Kapus? Kapus, basically these were the Jewish inmate in Auschwitz that were forced by the Nazis to stand as guards on their own inmates. You see how degrading this is. Mm -hmm. And this is the way to shut down conversation. Mm -hmm. Anti-Semite, Islamophobe, you hate America, you hate the military, you hate Egypt, war on Christmas. This is how you shut an environment
that does not allow this agreement is not an environment made for let growth. It's an environment made for control. Let me ask you this. On, say, take the student protests in yes, America, sir. a university. I have no problem instinctively with students protesting. Mm -hmm. It's actually part of the DNA of being a student, right? But I do have a problem with two things. One, the protests that happened almost immediately after October the 7th, within hours, which were clearly deeply deliberately inflammatory and hurtful mm -hmm. to Jewish people. Secondly, I have a real problem with the students who were beaming direct pro-Hamas slogans onto buildings on campuses in America. You know, I'm all for free speech, and I really am. The whole show is predicated on that. But not to the point where you see Jewish students barricaded into libraries because a mob is descending on them. There is a distinction to me between people who are obviously overtly, I mean, there was a professor at Cornell University who was literally seen in public shouting how exhilarated he felt by the attacks of October the 7th. Mm -hmm. He still hasn't been fired, that guy. Mm -hmm. I think that crosses a line. Do you? Yeah. I do not like this way. I mean, I can understand why, but I don't condone it. I would never, because you have to understand, these people, again, I'm not supporting them. Uh, I, I just want to make sure about two things. The reason that I started with anti-Semitism because I wanted to make sure to clear any confusion mm. that when I speak about Israel, I'm speaking about Israel. Yes. When I speak about Jewish people, I'm speaking about Jewish people. Yes. When I speak about my Zionists, I'm speaking about Zionists. It was very... Because no, I, I think it was yeah, very powerful ve that you did that. Yeah, I, I have and to be careful. That's the first thing you did because I think it's really important. Yeah, but at the same time, when I tell you why does that happen, it doesn't mean that I condone it. There's a difference between explanation mm. and justification. Those people who are exhilarated the way that they, this is the, the, the same uh, reason why people were so happy about the interview. Mm. What do they see? They see Israel as a, a criminal state who is killing their people and in the same time they are supported by the international community and the, the American. They have no guns, they have no superpower backing them. All they have is just the feeling of happiness like yes, our enemies that we cannot touch them has been hurt. All they can think about mm. that these are their enemies that have been hurt, right? I'm not condoning this, but again, it, 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 like when people were uh, celebrating terrorist attacks, you know, against Western, uh, Western targets, of course I don't condone that. But why? Because those people have been, from, from a very young age, what have they seen? They're not being heard by the media. The, the plight and the suffering of the brothers in, Israel, in, in Palestine, in the Arab world, are not being heard. People in Iraq, mm -hmm. you know, like when, when America and Britain invaded Iraq, mm -hmm. right? What, we, what we, the Arabs saw, it's like two superpowers are coming in on, on just regular people. So whenever there was like a bomb or like an attack on American troops, people would celebrate. Yeah, there are enemies. Emotions are very inflammatory. Yeah. And it is not right, but those people have nothing else. All they say is just like shout. All they say is like to, to, to rejoice. It is not right. Again, I'm explaining why is this happening because it's like, yeah, if I cannot get you, I'm just going to scratch your eyes. Mm. I'm going to scratch your eyes because, because you've been beating me all the time and you have the whole international community backing you up and all I can do is scream. Mm. Is it right? No. But it is understandable. Again, it's not the right thing. But I, no, it's not like understandable. It's like, oh, I, 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 no. But again, it is an explanation. Now, hate. And again, this is another way why this has been magnified in the media so much. What does the Western audience see? They see people rejoicing for the death of innocent civilians in Israel. This is what have the Arabs seen for years in, 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 uh, on the Arab world. For example, if you look up Sidrot Cinema, this is in 2014 when Israel was bombing Gaza as usual. And the Israelis in the Sidrot, uh, uh, the kibbutz or the, the settlement, they, were sit they went on a hill and they had popcorn and they had drinks and they were like watching the show and they were cheering with every rocket coming down. This is what we see. Western media, people didn't see that. Well, somebody found a tweet actually of mine yeah. from 2014 mm -hmm. in which I said, at what point does what Israel is currently doing to the Palestinian people become terrorism? Mm -hmm. And because I've always said, you know, I've spoken about this a lot over the years and I've always tried to be extremely fair minded, albeit nobody really wants you to be fair minded. They want you to take a side. But that was clear that my thinking back then was that they were absolutely overstepping. Absolutely. The mark. Absolutely. But um, again, to the point of rejoicing. No, I know what you mean. Yeah. Is but it, like if you, for yeah. example, Google, Google 
the wedding of hate. Mm. This is like an, a Jewish wedding in Israel where they were celebrating the arsons and no, the no, burning seen, of, of Palestinians. No, but but I'm, I'm, to be clear, I've seen lots of videos. No, 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 but I'm talk, not talking to you, Pierce. No, no, I know. I'm, no. I'm talking to the Western audience because, no, I, because I, I want to see, like, I want to say, like, this is what they mm. see. I mean, for example, there is a very famous video for Samuel Ab Abu Zanin, who is like a young kid that he was shot point blank by an Israeli soldier and he was not allowed to have any medical attention. Mm. And as his dead body was being put into the ambulance, the Jewish settlers were cheering. Mm. So for an Arab audience, this is what we see every day. Mm. So when they see, oh, we heard them back, mm. we heard their people like they heard back, it is not right. But this is what hate does. Mm. It escalates, it feeds each other. Radicalism feeds it. It is terrible and it is, a, it is just like a vicious circle. So I would like to do something that is very interesting mm. today. I want, when I invited John Stewart to my show, as much of like a reception that you, if, if you've seen the YouTube, people just like, no, sorry, sorry. we had to cut the five minute standing ovation mm. for broadcast. People were on their feet for mm. five minutes. They could not believe it. I remember uh, John Stewart telling me, I could never imagine that a Jewish guy from New Jersey would have that kind of reception in Cairo. Mm. And yet, on the internet, people who would have, what, mm. you brought a Jew on your show? Why you are with a Jew? Yes, hate is there, yes. So. And the, and the thing is like why we do not see each other, people in the Middle East, people in the West, that we do not put ourselves in each other's sh uh, shoes. And I want to do something very interesting today. I want to give, I, I'm, 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 I like telling stories. And I'm going to tell you a very nice story. Tell and this way. is the story, surprise, surprise, of the suffering and the plight of the Jewish people. And I want to say that because it is very interesting when you see the trauma and the suffering that the people on the other side went through, you might understand why, why they're coming through. So this is, see this? Mm -hmm. This is a map of all of the history of the expulsion of the Jews in Europe. They have been like, I have not, never seen a minority being kicked around this much, right? And of course, this comes back to the, you know, the whole idea about the original sin that you have uh, betrayed uh, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, the, 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 the blood of Jesus is on your hand. And then comes the 11th century. At that time, Jewish people were not allowed to own land. They were just peasants. Even some of the professions were not even allowed to participate in. But they were allowed to do one thing, usury, money lending, because it was prohibited by the Catholic Church to engage into that. So what happens when you work in money? You get richer, right? And those Jews lived in ghettos. Now, ghettos was not just like isolated neighborhoods and cities. Sometimes ghettos were outside the city. This is like how isolated they were. And in those ghettos, they have to pay gold to the mayor or the governor or the prince or the noble. So they would say, mm, you're getting richer. I need more taxes. So they pay tax. What happens when you have a business and they increase your rent? You increase your service, increase the taxes. Increase the so what happened? What, the Christians started to default. And suddenly, the image of the greedy Jew was created. Shylock, merchant of Venice. If it will feed nothing else, it will feed my revenge. You know, I like, never did I see uh, known, uh, a creature uh, uh, like, you know, uh, like, like uh, I can't remember that. I never did I saw like, a, a creature that looked like a man so keen and greedy, uh, oh, confound love, so confound of a man. I'm, I, you know, English, I messed it up. Anyways. But this is, this is, was the image, greedy Jew, the greedy Jew. This was created because of their conditions. And it came, became worse in 1095, when Pope Urban II called for the first crusade to go and, 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 and save the birth, the birth of Jesus from the unbelievers Muslim. And you know, this crusade did not kill a single Muslim. You know how many people they killed? 2,000 Jews. Because it's like, wait, the non-believers are all over there. Why? So they went to the, it's called the Crusades of the Rhineland. So they went to the Jewish community because, hey, we own the money. So let's kill them better than paying them. And then came the plague. And then all of the things like, oh, they're killing babies, babies. Who would that do that to a baby? You know? And they accused them of, of poisoning the well. This was the kind of oppression that the Jewish people went through. Fast forward 19th century, there was like the Eastern Jew in Ukraine and, and Russia, and there was the Western Jew, uh, Jews in Europe. 
those people in the East, the Eastern Shoes, had to immigrate because they were pogroms and they were like, you know, kicked out. And that at a certain point, the people in the West, especially in England, it's like, mm, there are too many Jews. We need a solution. The solution for what? For the Jewish problem. So it's like we need to get rid of them. And you know what? Palestine was not even on the, in the A list. Palestine on the, was in the B list. Because England proposed 6,000 square miles in Uganda for the Jews, 1903. And the reason why Palestine was not on the list, that it was objected by a lot of rabbis that said, like, it's a promised land, but only when the Messiah comes. But uh, there were other options, Argentina, South Africa, Uganda, Madagascar. And eventually, they said, all right, let's do Palestine. So they went to Palestine in 1914. There was 700,000 people living in Palestine, 3% were Jewish. 1917, Belfort Declaration. Arthur Belfort, he called the Jewish people in England that they are alien and hostile race. And the thing is, the only Jewish member of the parliament, of the English parliament, Lord Montenegro, he objects and like, these are British citizens. They, we should not kick them out. So they pushed him, they pushed him, but it was not going fast enough. Came the Nazis. And then it was not about the solution anymore. It was the end losing, the final solution by Hitler, because he needed an answer for the Jewish question, the Jude Frage. And then, the, as you see, the Holocaust happened, the most orchestrated, industrialized, horrible genocide in our modern time. Six million Jews died. So it accelerated, and they went. First of all, they left East Europe, and they went to West Europe, and they went to America, and they were turned down, and they were pushed towards Palestine. So by 1948, right before the declaration of the State of Israel, there were two million people living there. Only 30% of them was Jews. So the whole idea of like a land without a people to a people without a land was a marketing thing. They were already Palestinians. So suddenly, from our perspective, the Jewish problem is not a Jewish problem, is not a Middle Eastern problem, is not an Arab problem, it is a European problem. It was pushed on us together with the guilt because now we are the anti-Semite. We are, now we are the Jewish hater. And not just that, they took land. So people look at this like, why are we even, we, we had a lot of refugees coming in. And during that, there was a lot of, as you know, Zionist militia, the Aragon, the Haganah, all of these people were killing Palestinians, the, the, the famous massacre of their Yassin. You're talking about the atrocities of October 7th, it's horrible. But in the Arab mind, there is there a scene where there is an incredible movie called Tantura, T-A-N-T-O-U-R-A, where they, the, the Israeli members of those uh, 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 militias, they talk about the atrocities that they did, including opening up the pregnant woman bellies and ha having bets if the boy inside is a boy or a girl. It is one of the most horrific, and they talk about it, some talk about it with regret, and some talk about it with pleasure. We did that, right? Mm -hmm. So you have uh, even King David, I think your Prime Minister, Mr. Sunak, was there. And I, as I, if I was British, I would question this. Because as you know, King David was bombed by the Aragon militias. Mm -hmm. 91 British soldiers died. I don't know, as a, if I was British, how come my Prime Minister would have the nerve to stay in that hotel. I mean, you know, the ghost of the 91 British soldiers, that must be haunting for them, you see? So when you see all of that, and you see that suddenly, overnight, 1948, there were 1. 1. 1.5 million Palestinians, seven, half of them, three quarters of them were overnight pushed into refugees. Yeah. And this is why it's called the Nakba, the catastrophe. So now we have all of this building up into the minds. And, that, and so, suddenly this was like a conflict, a hate, a problem that we didn't have to do anything with. This was basically pushed on us by the Europeans. You see? See, this is why it is important to say that. And I'm not saying that just like, oh, let's wipe out the state of Israel. Let's like push them in the sea. No, but it's important when you talk about the conflict, that you talk about the root causes, right? No, there, were a, there was like a vibrant Palestinian culture happening over there. And right now, they are erasing this culture. Suddenly, I'm seeing of like Israeli feta cheese, Israeli hummus. Oh, that's an insult. Israeli hummus. Come on. I mean, take the land, but leave the hummus, man. I mean, come on. I mean, that's, that's not fair. Mm -hmm. You are someone who's always spoken against culture, uh, uh, cancel culture. Mm -hmm. Right now, a whole culture is canceled. Let me, let me ask you this. Jonathan Friedland is a top Jewish journalist for The Guardian newspaper. He wrote a very interesting column last week in which he said, at the root of all this, you could argue you have two sets of people with just cause, and they believe passionately in their just cause. 
and he was sort of advising people not to take sides unless you really understand the history. Do you, would you agree with that? Would you agree that both sides have legitimate just cause? Not with the methodology that's taken place, and you've given an extremely detailed analysis of the build-up to what happened in 48. To me, it's pretty clear 700, 800,000 Palestinians were displaced from their Overnight. homes, and it should never have happened. And that has been absolutely, I think, the root cause for so much resentment. But can you, at the heart of this debate, agree with Jonathan that you could argue there is just cause on both sides? There is a, there is a cause on both sides, but I, I, I'm, I'm walking on a tightrope here because yeah. I'm not a Palestinian. Yeah. Uh, but from the Palestinian point of view, th there's a lot of people. I mean, there are 2.2 million people living in Gaza. There are 3.5 million people living in the West Bank. There is 350,000 people living in East Jerusalem, and there is like si six or seven million people living outside. Mm -hmm. Those people, the Palestinians that were pushed out, they do not have the right to go back. Right now, if you meet Palestinians, you'll see them wearing a necklace with a key. That key is their house that they were kicked out from in, in Yaffa and in Haifa. You know, like my, my, my wife's family comes from Ramla, which is 50 miles from Gaza. And, and, and according to the law, those people have absolutely no right to go back. Even you, if you are a Palestinian with an American passport, they give you hell in order to go in. And yet, a Jewish person born anywhere in the world, born in Poland, born in the Ukraine, no question asked, he can jump on a plane, land in Israel, and get the, uh, the, the, the Israeli citizen and take a house that most probably belonged to a Palestinian. So it is not just like, a, it is an ongoing injustice that has been happening. Now, I mean... Where would you criticize, if you're being fair-minded, where would you criticize from 48 onwards the behavior of the Arab side? Well, put yourself uh, in the Arab side. At 1948, you constituted 70% of right. the population. Suddenly, the UN is giving you 48% of the land, right? Not just that, I mean, the, the Arab regimes, because they did terribly, and see, this is the thing, like, Arab nationalism at the height of nationalism, mm -hmm. these people feed on each other. You know, because it's very, very important to have a problem. Mm. Oh, it's Israel. And, then, and for Israel, oh, it's the Palestinian. It's a very good distraction. I mean, sometimes I feel that, like, the Palestinian cause is very useful for both sides to stay there as attention because it's always a way to reflect. But, uh, and this is a very important question because the, in the mind of the Western audience, mm. they always thought of the Palestinian resistance or the Palestinian side as, like, Islamic, as militant. No. As a matter of fact, some of the early suicide bombers were female Christian Palestinians because they, like the IRA, you know, they were fighting for a land. The whole idea of Islamization of the whole cause came very later. As a matter of fact, you will find this very interesting because when I saw this, I did not believe it. This, you know, the Fatah movement, which is the PLO, the okay. Fatah. Okay. This was their uh, slogan. Can you see? You see... There's a crescent, a cross, and a menorah. And they say, unitary, democratic, non-sectarian. So basically, in the 1960s, Fatah were basically marijuana-smoking tree-hugger hippies. And yet, that didn't work, right? And the thing is, I always hear that, like, Arabs were giving two, four, so many chances for peace. That is not true. As a matter of fact, all along history, Israel didn't give an inch of land by peace. 1974-73 uh, war, they gave back Sinai because uh, Egypt like initiated the war. 2006, they went out of uh, south of Lebanon because of the resistance they have. Even the disengagement of, of Gaza, they didn't do it out of the goodness of their heart because they had too much casualties. And even, even, even the Oslo Accords, the peace treaty, the one that Isaac Rabin and, uh, got the Nobel Prize for, they did it because of the Intifada. So what is the message that Israel is giving to the Arabs? I will never give you anything with peaceful resolution. You will always have to fight for it. Do you not think that, for example, I mean, Bill Clinton feels this very strongly, that there was a great deal to be done, and Arafat, just in the end, having indicated the whole time that if we got to this place, there would be a deal, just walked away. That that was the closest that everybody came, and that actually, I mean, could Clinton have done any more than he tried to do then? I am not, again, that's why it's very important to have people who are much more qualified than me to talk about this, but two things I can say about that. 
Number one, uh, the, the whole thing about the Oslo Accord, there was a video for Netanyahu who was talking to the settlement offer in 2001 and he was bragging about sabotaging. Mm. The, he was talking to the like, I sabotage it, like uh, there was going to be no yeah. peace. Yeah, you've seen that, right? Yeah. And in that video, if you remember, when, when he was saying like, you have to hit them hard, 2001, no Hamas at the time. Mm. They, were, we have, they were talking about the Palestinian Authority. We have to hit them, we have to kill them, we have to make them feel the pain. And then one of them says like, like Bibi, but wouldn't America kind of just like, so what? The American public is easily manipulated. 80% are with it. It is absurd. And as a new American, mm -hmm. where I can have the um, privilege of being retrospectively angry, I said, like, this guy is mocking the government who is, and the people who have been with him all the time. It's like, oh, they can be easily manipulated. They can do it. And even, by the way, even Isaac Rubin, Isaac Rubin, the, the, the one who actually did the peace accord. He was known famously said the way to actually beat those children is to break their bones with the broken bones policy. They were like, get those kids and break their bones on the pavement. So this has, it, the whole idea about like Israel wanted peace and Arabs only wanted to fight is a very, very actually, bad representation. I actually think as, it, as it's gone on, the will, the genuine will on both sides for peace has not existed. No. I think it's been a deceit to the world. Uh, no, I'm sorry. And, and to the relative groups of people on both sides the official and, a, and actually a betrayal of them. the official stand of the Palestinian Authority and again I cannot speak I mean, mm. it is very difficult to do this the official stand of the Palestinian Authority is that we are just happy with 22% of the land just give us like that yes there are people that this but the thing is you cannot just say okay let's talk about peace and then you take away my land let's talk about peace and the, there's there's a kind of like passive aggressiveness happening oh let's talk about it, but I'm gonna build settlements I'm going to suffocate your cities and your villages. You see, I think I'm that has been incredibly inflammatory. Yes. Worsening the situation. I think putting back the chance of peace. I mean, Netanyahu, I interviewed Netanyahu earlier this year in the middle of the big social protests in his own country. And I couldn't understand what he thought he was doing, except that it seemed to me political expediency that he had to, to get power, uh, you know, again, he had put a bunch of right-wing headbangers into his cabinet who have incredibly bad records, speak in an incredibly incendiary way about uh, Palestinians, for example. And he did this for power. And then he launched, a, because they were pushing him to do it, a ridiculous assault on the integrity of the Supreme Court, the independence of the Supreme Court. And, and many Israelis rose up. So mm -hmm. Netanyahu is, has become, to me, a big problem. Right, and, and the people, that all the polling shows that. Israeli people are very unhappy with Netanyahu. I don't think he's ever going to actually want to forge peace. And in fact, I think he was instrumental with Hamas in wanting to keep them in power because he felt that that would create the split with the Palestinians, yeah. with two political groups, and that would be good for Israel. And it was leaked in a Likud uh, conference in 2019 yeah. that he was bragging about giving Hamas money because this is a way that we can keep Palestinians divided, and yet so we, we and we'll never have one. So this is a guy who but, was. But, but look, we can agree about Netanyahu. I think. No, right? but not just Netanyahu. There, there's a book. And, and, there, and I would say most of his cabinet. There, right there's now. a book called The Fear of Peace. It's by, by Moshe Zimmerman. Mm. And he's an Israeli historian, and he said, like, the average Israeli citizen does not have a vision of peace. Yeah. Because for 70 years, this is a country that has been, the military, the war has been going on for, what, yeah. they have been expanding because of war, the military is taking over. So the whole idea of peace is not even there. Yeah. It's not just Netanyahu. Like, like, you have, I remember you have interviewed uh, Naftali Bennett. Yes. And I think you tweeted that like that was like uh, a very um, kind of reasonable take. Mm. Yeah, I don't think I said reasonable. No. Yeah, yeah. But like I, I, this, Naftali, in the, he went after Queen Rania, mm. and he called up shame on Queen Rania. No, I didn't say reasonable. I just said this. I did a, a fire emoji. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just said that what he was saying. Yeah. I mean, I was going to ask you about Queen Rania, and let's ask about since yeah. you've raised it, yeah. because Queen Rania accused the West of a glaring double standard. She said, it's the first time in modern history there's such human suffering and the world is not even calling for a ceasefire. So the silence is deafening and to many in our region it makes the Western world complicit. Uh, now, other people said, well, okay, if you feel that strongly, why aren't you taking in any Palestinians? Why is Egypt not taking ah, Palestinians? Why does the Arab world want to constantly attack 
Israel without actually offering any place to go for the Palestinians. And what do you say to that? That is exactly what Israel wants. And that is exactly what might actually starts Third War III. This is the war solution. These are Palestinians, these are their land. Mm. And then suddenly take them, why? So they've been basically kicked around from their homes. And now another country should take them? You see what will happen? Imagine this, mm. now. And because Israeli officials have been talking openly about this. Mm. It's like, why don't they just go in Sinai? Why they go? You know what would happen? Those people are gonna be pushed in Sinai. And with any population, two million people, they are living in refugee camp. What do you think will happen? Unrest. Mm. Uh, uh, chaos mm. and then after a few years the Western media will come with their cameras like oh look at those Arabs oh they're killing each other oh Israel is good that they got rid of them and then they will go to the West Bank and so they know 3.5 million people push into Jordan this the whole idea why does Jordan take them why does Egypt take them the same question you, Europe has 44 countries why don't they take Israel America has 50 states. Why don't they give them Florida? I mean, they, we seem to complain about Florida the whole time. Why don't they just like give uh, Israel? The whole idea was like, oh, you're Arabs, you're all the same. No, no, no. Because what would happen then? So Israel will move into Jordan? That's like, oh, Saudi, why don't you take the Jordanian? So the, 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 this is not I a solution. You, hear, this I is hear, not a solution. Basil, I, I hear you. I'm not taking a position yeah. another way. Let me ask you directly. But I want to say something about what Queen Radia said. Okay. The whole idea about like the West. Yeah. I think that in three weeks, Israel morally corrupted the West like no other. I think the West will have a lot of time to recover because for years, the West has been telling us, oh look, we are liberal, we're all about human rights, all are equal, adopt our values. And then suddenly, well, you, you don't want to even to cease, we don't want to even tell Israel to stop. And suddenly we wake up and we found McDonald's are giving free meals to the Israeli, because like nothing will make you feel better after killing a bunch of okay, Palestinian okay. kids than a happy meal. So, you let, know? Me, so let me ask you this. They have a toy. So, so this brings me to Hamas, okay? So what Israel will say, because they say it to me every time they come on the program, whoever from Ehud Barak to Natalie Bennett, whoever it may be, they say, look, we suffered such a catastrophic terror attack on October the 7th that we have decided we are going to get rid of Hamas. There are 40,000 or so. Hamas terrorists in their eyes who need to be got rid of. And I do believe they're terrorists. Only terrorists can commit the kind of act of terrorism we saw. So can we, on that point, can we agree on that? Do you believe Hamas is a terror group? It is, it is classified by America as a, I, I'm not a big fan of Hamas, and they're a militant group that does like stuff like- Are they terrorists, do you think? Yeah. Cool. Okay, okay, so mm. we agree on this. Mm -hmm. So you have 40,000 of them living in Gaza amongst the civilian population. If Israel has decided to eliminate a terror group, Hamas, as the world did with ISIS, for example, and I think there are a lot of parallels given the way they behaved on October the 7th to ISIS, how do you do it? How do you do it if you don't do it the way Israel is currently trying to do it? Exactly not the way that Israel does it, because if you have the, one of the most advanced military powers in the world, and it takes you three weeks, 9,000 Palestinian civilian death, 21,000 injured. As we are talking right now, Israel just bombed Kichibalia, which is a known refugee camp. This, it is a very, this is, a, this is not self-defense. You know, like one of the most questions, like does Israel have the right to defend itself? Mm. This is a no value question. This is a no value question. Well, I would ask a different point. I would say, not only do they have a right to defend themselves, which every country would yeah. after a terror attack, right? But they actually have a duty and responsibility to their population to try and stop that happening again to them. They've been doing... And I do, I do understand and I agree with that. Yeah, but, but here's the thing. If it takes you all of that time, all of these civilians, to take out a few hundred guerrilla fighters. We don't know how many of the people A few who thousand. Died. We don't know. It do doesn't we? matter. Yeah, but Basim, you don't know and I don't know. We don't know, but right? like... We don't even know if the casualty numbers are correct because they're all coming from Hamas. And we, the should, health and, and we should believe Israel? No, no, not necessarily, no. No, I, I don't believe either side. But, but, but here's my problem but, with but Israel. But here's my point. I don't think we should assume that we know these statistics okay. are correct. Mm -hmm. I don't think we should assume we know exactly how many children are being killed. We do know a lot have been killed. So the moral argument remains the same. But we don't know how many Hamas terrorists 
have been killed in the last three weeks. We just don't know, do we? So basically, we're, te we're dealing with a very incompetent military force that has been sucking America dry for years, and then they cannot do the job. But how else do they get rid of Hamas? Not like that. How do they do it? I don't know, but not like that, because they've been trying the same... You've got to have another... They have, uh, first of all, I'm not a military expert. Second of, no, all, second of all, they've been trying the same thing for years. Mm. They go in... They go this is not an eye for an eye anymore. This is an eye, a limp, a life, a house, a neighborhood, a whole population sit, for an eye. That they is, don't sit, I mean, your, your friend Ben Shapiro that you particularly despise. Oh, he, I love Ben Shapiro, he's yeah. very smart. Oh yeah, but you've, you've been very critical of him, and that's fair enough, I'm sure he would be of you. But when I asked him about proportion, he said there is, I don't care about a, a proportionate response. So let's right? kill civilians as- Hamas did this, right? so we are going to get rid yeah, of Hamas. But, but, but he, it's not, it's not, in his eyes, it wasn't eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. It was this group of terrorists did this, and we are now going to rid the world of these terrorists. And this is very important to look at things in context. When you see how Israelis talk inside their community. Mm -hmm. There was a very famous post by Uri uh, Eritzol, he is the, uh, speechwriter of uh, Netanyahu, he said, what is so horrific about understanding that the whole Palestinian people are our enemies? All of them are enemy combatants. We should call them, kill their mother, destroy their homes, the homes that they raised, those snakes, so no snakes will be raised in this house anymore. And this was reposted by Ali Chaket, which is the minister of, wait for it, justice. Yeah. Those, this, it's not about Hamas anymore. It is not about Hamas. They, they can tell you it's about Hamas, but it's not about, it is basically, it has, they have said it many times, Pierce. This is a way to kind of push them into Sinai. This is not about eradicating Hamas. This ship has sailed. I am sorry, but like, I, th anybody who still believes that this is about Hamas is stupid. Because you they- see, I, I don't agree with that. Really? No, because I think- but why, So why are why there- I'll tell you why I don't agree. There are like 100 people- I think any Gaza country, and, any uh, country that suffered the kind of terror attack that Israel suffered with the kind of death toll that occurred that day, 1,500 plus people, grandmothers, kids, young women being raped, kidnapped, beheaded, it's been reported, and so on. Well, you can raise an eyebrow. I mean, they found a, they found a young woman's skull, right? Somehow but I, but been, what about the, somehow been but what about the babies from, that were beheaded? Well, there was a report, and you and I had this discussion on air. You falsely quoted me, and I wanted to clarify that with yeah. you in person. You thought I'd said that 40 babies had been beheaded. So what did you say? I never said that. What did you say? I said it's been reported that 40 babies were killed, some of whom had been beheaded. That's what I said. Yeah. Totally, so there's a, totally different. Yeah. It's a very different... Well, it is different. Yes. Do you, you accept it? Um, English is a second language, so... But they're different might, things. Of course, yes. Between sure. saying 40 babies have been beheaded and 40 babies have been reported to have been killed, including so some where are those beheaded who were beheaded. Babies? Well, apparently journalists are being shown utterly okay, horrific okay. footage. This, is, this comes to a very important question about credibility. Again, I'm not condoning what mm. happened in October, but in, I'm not a journalist. Mm. But as a journalist, wouldn't you take anything that an authority would say with a grain of thought? Yes. Especially if this authority have a long history of lying. And I'm just going to give a few examples. 1996, they bombed Khan. It's a refugee camp. They killed 106 people. Uh, despite that they knew it's a refugee camp. They said, oh, maybe it's a one time off. 2006, they bombed Khan again. 2014, they killed two teenagers at a checkpoint. They denied, as usual, but CNN was there. So they said, mm, we have to say it. 2018, they killed a medic, a Palestinian medic, and they doctored. They fabricated a video showing that it's someone else, that he was a human shield. And then I they. Say, but, now, can, can I just like finish? Yeah, that? but I do want to respond. And, the, and then 2010, they killed Ahmed Oraikat, mm. denied it, then said, oh, it's okay, it's mm. us. 2021, they bombed the media office in Hamas. Mm. It's not us, but no, I'm sorry. And then, 11th May 2022, mm. Shirin Abu mm. a reporter, your colleague, she's Palestinian, American citizen, she was shot in the head. And they provided forensic evidence and even a doctor video mm. that it was not them, it was Islamic Jihad. How can I expect to believe this regime, especially if the president of Israel comes down with this ridiculous, ridiculous thing? Have you seen them there? there? No. He said, okay. This was reported by Sky News, mm. and it was the funniest thing I've seen so much. This was a Colin Powell moment, mm. but like the cheap edition. Mr. Uh, Herzog said, like, Isaac Herzog is like, we have found evidence on one of the uh, um, terrorists, a manual to create chemical bombs. Mm. And then he showed this, <laughs> and he showed, uh, this is, so I, I just want to say, 
Why would a foot shoulder go in into any that with like a manual to a chemical bombing? It's like, is that BYOB? Bring your own beer a bomb? It's, like, it's, it's crazy. And and uh, what, what what he like have like local ingredients to make up? And then this is like this is a manual of Al-Qaeda, of course, convenient state in Qaeda. And let me read it to you in Arabic because this is funny. So which basically say. <laughs> This is basically like a catalog for self-improvement for Mujahid. <laughs> I didn't know that they have life coaches. So this, and you know what? It's kind of said. It's like we cannot confirm or uh, any of this, but we will show it anyway. So let and me respond. Let so me respond. this is like a, a, let me respond. A, a, this is a lying government. So let me respond. I yes. do think the Israeli government has lied all the time, right? I do think they've lied. I'm not going to dispute that. I do think they've been caught lying. I do think they've said things that turned out not to be true. I also think that two weeks ago, a hospital was bombed, yes. and it was immediately. What do you think they did? Well, I'm going to tell you what I think. Mm -hmm. Hamas immediately tell the world it was an Israeli airstrike, and that 500 people were killed, and that the hospital had been destroyed. And then, as the next couple of days go by, the hospital is relatively undamaged. The car park was obliterated. Many fewer people than 500 were killed. How many people died? Well, we don't know because actually we're reliant on the Palestinian health authority, which is mm. Hamas in Gaza, for the figures. So we don't know the number. But a lot fewer people died, it would appear, than the like 500. We don't know. 50? Uh, either way, it's appalling, but it may not have been anywhere near as appalling as was first said by Hamas. But here's the point. Most independent studies of what happened have concluded that it was almost certainly a militant stroke terror group inside Gaza and they fired a rocket which landed in the hospital car park. In other words, it wasn't an Israeli airstrike. So I have an issue with that. Mm. Because for three days before the attack, the priest and the patriarch of the hospital, because it's called the, pa the Baptist mm. Hospital, said that they have received warning, multiple warning from Israel that they're going to mm -hmm. hit the hospital. Mm -hmm. And then at the time of the hit of the hospital, one of the top aides of Netanyahu, he tweeted about, like, we hit the hospital. And then he deleted it. And then basically, like Israel gas lighted the world. But, oh, it was not but, us. Most it was not us. but that's why I said most independent. No, that's not true. New York Times actually like just published something to prove that it was shot from Israel. And the thing is, no, okay, they didn't. Though. Okay, numbers. They didn't. Numbers. That's, that's not true. Okay. The New York Times has not reported that it was Israel. No, they said they. They haven't. Okay. That's not true. Over ten years, Hamas launched thirty-five thousand rockets into Israel. They and many failed. They killed. 69 people mm. and 25% uh, military, only part of them were civilians. So over 10 years of 35,000 rockets, they killed 69 people. But in one strike, you want to tell me that these glorified firecrackers caused that kind of damage? Uh, yes, it looks like they did, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And actually, it wasn't the damage that was reported by Hamas, okay. who wanted people to believe it was an Israeli airstrike. Right. So my point would be, I'm happy to concede that Israel government has lied about stuff over mm -hmm. the years. But I'm absolutely certain as well that Hamas lie all the time. Why are we holding a militant... Including, I believe, why from all I've read, I believe they lied about the hospital. Why are we holding the militant terrorist group to the same standards as the best because and only... They because they happen, to be the the, they happen to be the ruling party in Gaza. So they're not just a terror group. They are a political group as well, okay. political party. Um, okay. Well, they are. Mm -hmm. So the question again comes this, and, and so far you've ducked it, so I want to ask you one more time. We can both agree that the scenes in Gaza right now are horrific, because I do feel that. But I don't know how else Israel can eradicate Hamas than the way that they're currently trying to do it. Do you have an alternative for them? Well, again, we are locked in the same thing, what can we do now? But we don't look at what was happening over there. You, the best recruiter for Hamas is Israel. I mean, you have talked a lot about the horrible conditions in Gaza. Yeah. I mean, let's imagine like a little boy called Rami. He lives in Gaza. You know, he have a horrible life, but like, you know, it's like, it's not that bad. I know he has a cousin in the West Bank. He's living a good life. He wake up in the morning and he found out that he was kidnapped by three settlers. He was burned alive by kerosene and he was forced to drink the kerosene. His name was Muhammad Abu Khudir. Right? That settlers did that to him in 2016. Said, so, all right, you know what? I'm just going to leave is I'm going to find a way to go to Europe. His aunt is an, a published author 
and she won a prize in the Frankfurt Book Fair. His name is Adnaya Shalem. And now she was canceled because of what's happening, just because of her a Palestinian. His other aunt in America, his name is Amawi. She is a speech therapist. And I, this is close to my heart because of my son. Mm -hmm. And she was uh, fired because she did not want to sign the co for government con that said that you cannot join BDS, which I don't understand why do people choosing to protest peacefully by not buying goods from a certain country, why would the United States make that its own issue? Mm -hmm. So, and this guy, this, uh, this Rami is being approached by, by like, oh, join Hamas, join us, let's go kill Israel. No, 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 no I don't want to kill, I'm just, I'm going to live in Gaza. It's a life. But 97% of water is not good for human consumption. Half of the population are anemic. Even the is not being treated, and it goes into the shores of Israel. It's like, oh, that was Palestinian. It's horrible. horrible. Yeah. So, and then he and he wakes up in the morning. He doesn't think about killing Jews the first thing in the morning. He thinks about being there at five o'clock at the first 50 people in the line for bread because yeah. if he doesn't, he will miss the food for his family. And he goes back, and he finds a message saying that we are going to bomb your house. He comes back. He loses his old family. Now, tell me, what is a proportionate response for that? I don't know. I don't know. You cannot create terrorism and then you... Uh, I, I don't know. You have, they, they have created would this. You, I, don't, I don't know is the answer. But Bassam, let me ask you this. Hamas will have known when they perpetrated what they did on October the 7th, what the scale of response was likely to be. How does that help the Palestinian people? I don't know. That they are supposed to serve. I don't know. The, 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 the wheels are it, already it, set in it, motion. But it doesn't, does it? I do not... You know, this is the... I feel sometimes that Hamas is with us in the room, that we are bringing Hamas. Who has the power in this equation? Who has the fourth largest and strongest military power? Mm -hmm. The whole idea about Israel is like, oh my God, we are there. the Arabs are going to destroy us. Look at the map. Hamas, because, well, hang on, let me, let me, hang on. Hamas's stated goal is the eradication yeah. of Israel and the Jewish people. Yes. They make no pretense about it. They've made no attempt, unlike the Nazis Absolutely. who try to cover up their crimes. Absolutely. They've made no attempt to yes. try and deny what they They brazenly boasted about it. Yes. They are proud of what they did. Mm -hmm. right? And they will have known, again, that the scale of what they did on October the 7th would have prompted this kind of response, which would have led to thousands of innocent Palestinians getting killed. And my question for you... I wish the 7th of October never happened. Right, but my... Every time, my every question time, question is, something happened. You say happened. Well, Hamas is everywhere. Well, yeah, it actually, all roads, yes, but, but, all but, roads on this but, particular okay. part of the crisis, and I accept it's been going on for 75 years, this conflict, but all roads in this crisis lead to Hamas and what they did. And, all, and all, not necessarily... Because, it, well, because yes. all roads goes to the condition that created Hamas. If the, if the Jewish people were expelled from Europe and went to Argentina or South Africa and Uganda and went in and took the land, you would have Hamas in all but of these places. You and I can agree that the conditions Palestinian people have had to endure in Gaza for a very long time are completely unacceptable. I think it's completely unacceptable yes. that Israel has wielded such control over the people of Gaza, working out who can come in and who can go out, turning on and off water and power on a whim, turning off the internet on and off at a whim, all that kind of stuff, I can completely agree with. But given that I think we agree Hamas are a terror group. Okay, let's say, well, okay. Let me finish my question. Mm -hmm. Given that we agree that Hamas is a terror mm -hmm. organization mm -hmm. who have a publicly stated position of annihilating not just Israel, but Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And as we saw on October the 7th, they mean it. If you are Israel, what do you do to get rid of those people who have shown the world that's exactly what they will actually do if they get the chance? You know what I would do? I would give the Palestinians what they deserve. Terrorism is a virus. Yes. It's a virus. I agree. If a patient with a flu came to you and you're a doctor, how can you treat that patient? How do you treat as a doctor? How do you do? Well, you're the doctor. You give them nutrition, yeah. fluids, yeah. and rest. So the immunity of the body gets rid of the virus on its own. Mm -hmm. If I received that patient with a flu and I took a sledgehammer, it's like, why are you not getting better? Do you think that patient will get better? No. You are weakening him. You are making him worse. Israel did not just like weaken the body of Palestinians, making them unable to get rid of hate and radicalism. They have openly bolstered about helping and giving money to the same terrorist organization. Mm. So, 
I agree. I think Netanyahu is complicit in keeping Hamas in power because it suited him politically. Yes. And I think you can't get away from that. Yes. Uh, there's no question of that. But there's also no question that the Israeli government, led currently by him, has to stop Hamas from perpetrating another terror attack. And again, it comes down to this question. What do they do to get rid of Hamas if it's not what they're doing? I don't know. But like, as an Israeli citizen listening to this, how come that my prime minister mm. bragging about giving money mm. to the terrorist group that he is using right now to eradicate a whole group of people and yet using them as an excuse. Isn't that weird? This is like, yeah, basic, this is like Tony Blair yeah. being like found like giving money to Al-Qaeda or yeah. ISIS and then going to fight them. How does this work? Yeah. How does this work? I agree. How does this work? Yeah, but so, a, I agree with so, you. So yeah, it's a terrorist attack. And Israel is funding them? I mean, this is, the, this is in the words of Benjamin. He is, this is the thing about Benjamin now. He brags about that stuff. Yeah. So this is a circular question. Yeah, but yes, I agree, I agree Israel, uh, Hamas is to blame. Who created Hamas? Who's helping them? And who is allowing for an environment for that kind of hate and, 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 and destruction of Jewish people to, to, to aspire? And the thing is, there's something very important to the Western audience here. They think that Israel is a small, tiny country between the hostile Arab countries. Mm -hmm. The biggest military power in the, in the Arab world is Egypt. They have a peace treaty. Mm -hmm. Their neighbors, Jordan, they have a peace treaty. Saudi Arabia, Emirates, either like have like full relationship or like on the way of normalization. Yeah. The only people that, even Syria, Syria is not like even like, mm. they, they launch like a single bullet. Mm. The only two crutches that, 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 that Israel has is like Hezbollah and Hamas. Yeah. A few militant, thousands of militants. Syria, is that really form an existential like threat, especially if I know that over 13 years, only not, not 69 Israelis were killed. I would say. I would say. Is that an? Is that, well, that? Would that really wipe out Israel? Is that? Is Israel that weak? I think if you have two groups of people, who are ideologically wedded to your destru destruction as a state and as a populace, and you're constantly firing rockets as Hamas have done for over a decade now, mm -hmm. then that cannot be acceptable. You have to stop that. Right? These are terrorists who've now shown on October the 7th, they're true colors. They don't just talk about wanting to kill all Jewish people. They are going to do it if they get the chance. So I don't believe Hamas can possibly stay in any position of authority in Gaza. I think that would be ruinous for not just the people of Gaza, but also for Israelis. So if you're going to get rid of them, which many people think on both sides is inevitable and should happen as a consequence of what they did, the big question is, how do you do that? And I don't know any other way yeah. other than the way Israel is currently doing. Hence my personal moral quandary about this. So if a terrorist takes over the Empire State, instead of taking him out, we bomb the whole Empire State? Well, that's the question, isn't it? Proportion. That is not even a question. Well, <laughs> that was not even a question no, because that would be ridiculous. You talk about, you talk about the normalization of the region. I mean, the theory that I most buy into, supported by recent, I think, Wall Street Journal reporting, that hundreds of Hamas terrorists had gone to Iran for training before this attack. Okay. It had obviously been very carefully organized, and so that is, I think, highly likely. But if you're Iran, and you're looking at all this normalization, and you're looking at Saudi Arabia being next, this is your worst nightmare. So a perfect time to commit an atrocity like this through your proxy of Hamas. Again, I'm not a, a political expert to know no. what is the background, but let me tell it's you. It's a likely theory. Is, is Hamas justified, is all of the horrible conditions that Palestinians mm. are living in, is that a justification for Hamas doing what they did in October no. 7th? Good. Do you think so? Of course not. Right. So we're agreed. No, of course. So let me ask you the question a different way. There is no justification what Israel is doing now. No Hamas, no terrorist attack justifies this. Well, because you have been there. No, but that's you the, have been there. You yeah. have stood against the Iraq war. Yes. And that is too much. Yeah, but here's the you are killing a whole population. No, here's the difference. I didn't stand against them for that reason. Mm -hmm. I stood against the Iraq war because I did not believe we had seen evidence that Saddam Hussein had okay. weapons of mass destruction. Uh -huh. So we were fighting a war against a country and a despotic leader which had nothing to do with 9-11, as they were trying to claim. It was actually a lie perpetrated on the world, and the consequences were disastrous. A million people died. I mean, over 150 British troops died. My brother served in Iraq and could have been one of them. You know, the whole thing was a fiasco, a deadly fiasco. It led to the rise of ISIS and all the hell that came with that. So, you know, I, yes, absolutely, 
I fought that campaign against that war and I wish I'd been successful. But the singular difference here is no one is disputing, least of all the Hamas themselves, that they perpetrated this attack. And I believe Israel has a fundamental right and a duty to defend its people from them doing it again. So if we can agree on that as a principle of a country that's had that kind of attack and how you deal with it, the question then becomes, how do you eradicate the people who did it? And I just think given the intense nature of the way the population exists in Gaza, very, very large numbers of people in confined places, and that is in itself unacceptable, and I will agree with you about all of that, and that has to be fixed longer term. But actually, if Hamas are everywhere there amongst these people, I just don't see any alternative mm. to what they're doing. And I'm very happy to consider one. But so, I don't think you have one either. So, so if, if the Iraqis were actually, there was evidence that they were behind 9-11, would that still be okay to kill well, a million we Iraqis? we have a parallel, which is Afghanistan. And in fact, I would say, but th that raises a different question. So uh, was the Afghanistan war just? I believe it was in a way that Iraq wasn't. I believe that Afghanistan was harboring terrorists, Al-Qaeda. We know that they were training there. We know the Taliban were, were there. And we went in, we launched this war. It goes on and on and on. Huge bloodshed on both sides. And in the end, after a ridiculous overnight pullout by America and President Biden, the Taliban are back in charge and wave, waging the same kind of medieval rule they waged before all this. So you've you got two things. Was it justified to strike back at Afghanistan for harboring al-Qaeda? I would say yes. Was the, did the means in the end justify the war? You could argue no, actually, because actually you ended up with the Taliban back in charge. So they're two different things. And it may well be here, by the way, as I've said, that if Israel pursues this ground invasion, it backfires horribly. It leads to a much wider conflict involving many other people, possibly including Iran directly. And it could be a horrendous escalation and a massive war raging through the whole region. And that is my fear about it. But I come back to the central point of justification. And I'm really struggling to see what else Israel is supposed to do to get rid of Hamas. And if you've got an alternative, let's hear it. I do. Pierce, this is never about Hamas. Believe me, it is never about Hamas. If somebody tells you who they are, listen. Israel has been telling the world all the time they need to clear the Gaza Strip into Egypt. You think that's always been the plan? Always there. I mean, they have said it. They have said it many times. Why does, why does Egypt take them? And do you think when Egypt takes them, do you think they'll go back? And then when they're done with Gaza, they will go back to the West Bank. They will kind of like build the settlements around them and then until they push them into Jordan, because that is the plan. They have talked, not just Benjamin Netanyahu, everybody said like, there's no state, two state. It is one state and it's for the Jews. I don't people. think he believes in a two state solution. Nobody really believes in a two state solution. It is one state. But nor do Hamas, obviously. And they're the ruling authority in Gaza. They, they don't. You see what you're comparing? It's a militant group. Mm. It's a small militant group. But they are, but they are Israel, the group, I, Israel as a nation... They as, are the elected political leadership. They were as, elected in 2006, and 50% of the people in Gaza right now are under the age of 16. They were not even born. I understand. Yeah, like, so, and, and the so, thing, all right, so, so Basim, let's, all right, let, let's agree about that. But that's the circle city. It's, I Hamas, understand. It's Hamas, a circular fire Hamas, squad. Hamas, Hamas, I know, Hamas, I know. Hamas. I know. But, okay, let's, let's move forward. Oh, yes. Let's, let's assume, somehow, we get to a place, possibly at the instigation of countries like Saudi Arabia and others getting directly involved, where you get to a place where Hamas are removed, and I don't quite see how that happens without enormous further bloodshed, but let's assume they get removed. Let's assume that Netanyahu is removed from office, which I think is highly likely just from the fury of his own people about what they see as the defensive and security failings, plus his attack on the Supreme Court already causing huge polarization. Let's assume we get new leadership in both places. Could there still be peace? Could there still no. be a two-state no. solution? No. It can never happen. No, because Israel have already shown it's, it's not about Netanyahu. Yeah. It is the policy of Israel not to give the Palestinians their seat. It has always been there. But what if you find leadership that understands? You will not. But why, you, why are you so... You will not. Why, why because, do you not think so? Because Israel has been... You know, but they would say the same about the other side. And I remember... Who has the power? Let me, let me, okay, let me give you a parallel. Obama you, in his book. Let me give you a parallel. Him, okay. Let me give you a parallel. Northern Ireland, okay? 
Northern Ireland appeared to be completely intractable, with the IRA and the loyalist paramilitaries trying to kill each other, in the IRA's case, trying to kill uh, British people as well, uh, because they, they did not want this to go the way that people wanted it to go. And ultimately, we got to peace because we found leaders who actually had the courage, the moral courage, to get in the room with the people that were trying to kill them and to do a deal. I don't think you can do that with Hamas. I think they're on a different scale altogether to the IRA. But we did have a seemingly intractable place riddled with violence okay. on both sides. And eventually, we got peace. Do you not see there's any chance of doing that? Here? No, not with Israel. Obama, af after he left office, he wrote in his book, the problem with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is that, that one side is extremely powerful mm. and one side is extremely weak. There is absolutely nothing to oblige that strong side to give anything. All over the years, Israel showed you many times that they are not interested in peace. Leave Gaza. Forget Hamas for a second. The West Bank. What have they been doing in the West Bank? The illegal settlements did not stop a single day. No, they no. Are and, and, it's, and it's completely wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but the thing but is, it's wrong. What I agree the, with you. But you see what they're doing in the West Bank right mm. now? They are creating little Gazas. Mm. They are creating little Gazas. Yeah. And uh, until they are like squeeze them, there was. There and is, it's completely wrong. There Gaza. is a hilarious documentary called "The Wanted 18." Mm. It is like an Israeli-Palestinian co-production, and it tells about the incredible story about the residents of Beit Sahur. It's a Palestinian town next to the Nazareth. And uh, they said they don't want to depend on the milk coming from the kaputs. So they bought 18 cows, 18 cows. And they didn't know how to milk the cows or have a cow farm. So, so they were like engineers and, and, and doctors. So they sent people to kind of like to learn how to do the farm. So they bought the cows and they started to produce milk and they started to sell the milk to the villages. The Israeli authorities were not very comfortable. So one day the military government came in and said, like, those cows, and I quote, constitutes an existential threat to the national security of the state of Israel. You need to get rid of them. And the movie goes about like the hilarious attempts of hiding those cows between the butchers and the houses. And in one scene, the, a cow is actually running and the, the Israeli soldiers are like running behind it and they corner it and they corner it and they're about to kill it. You know what did the cow say? He didn't fall for this. Cows don't speak. Yeah! <laughs> but you know, it actually said something. You know what did it say? It said, Hamas. But anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, this is the ideology of the Israeli uh, ruling party. They are not interested. They're not even allowing you to get your own cows. I mean, this. I want to discuss something that is very important because we have been talking about Israel being a democratic state, a secular state for all of its citizens, including its Arab residents, right? Yes. Wrong, 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 wrong. 2018, there was a resolution that was offered in the Knesset that say that Israel should be a state for all of its citizens. That seems basic, right? Mm -hmm. That resolution was not even allowed to be discussed. It's like, wait, why? And the, and the rebuttal was, Israel being the state of all of its citizens would threaten the character of the Jewish state. There is, uh, I have a friend of mine, his name is Andrew. He's Palestinian Christian, they do exist. And uh, his family comes from a town called Tarshiha. As many uh, Palestinian town, these would like, you know, being, had another Israeli town called Kafar Bradin. Uh, it is a left-leaning town. They voted against Netanyahu by 70%. And they announced an auction to sell houses. And then they noticed that most of the, the, the applicants were Palestinians. They canceled the auction. Why? Because in each Jewish town, there is something called admission committee that can decide who can live in this town. Sounds like Jim Crow for me. And then they canceled it. And you know what they say in the reason? They say, Kafar Radim welcomes all citizens of Israel despite the race, gender, or color. However, the, major, uh, the majority of the town would like to preserve the character of the town as being Jewish, Zionist, and secular. How does this go together, secular and Jewish aside? You know, and this brings me to this picture. This is a very famous picture. You know, remember this picture? I'm sure you've seen it. Yeah. This, for the people who don't know, this from uh, San Augustine, Florida, 19, 18th of June, 1964. This was a white-only motel. 
And these are, these are black activists who wanted to defy the law and jump into the hotel. This guy, he's the owner of the hotel. His name is James Brook. And he was pouring acid to scare them out of the hotel. His neighbor said that James Brook was a victim because he was just following the law. And you know what James Brook said? He said, it's not like I don't like black people. I just don't like them in my swimming pools. Now, if an official said that, wouldn't you say that this town has kind of a systemic racism? Yes. This, was, this quote was not said by James Brooke. It was said by Deton, the head of the Galilee municipality, when he said, I don't like Arabs. Mm. I don't just like them in my swimming pools. Mm. The town of Nazareth elite, 2010, the Arab Christians in the town, they requested to set up the Christmas tree next to another. This is the birth birthplace of Jesus. And you know what they said? We cannot have it because, because none religious, non-Jewish symbols would offend Jewish residents. But this comes back to what you were saying at the start, which is about the hate on both sides. No, 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 I'm not talking about the hate on both sides. I'm talking no, no, ab I'm about this shining example that Israel won't tell the world that mm -hmm. we are like the Western world, we are secular. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know this, but they're not just like secular, like, like Christians against their own Arab, I'm talking about like Arabs with Palestinian, with, with Israeli identity. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about them being even racist against their own people, 1950. Yemenis immigrants that came from Yemen and they were in the transition camp waiting to be transferred into Israel. Their kids were taken away from them and given to white Ashkenazi Jews and because they were not white enough. But Basim, what would happen if a Jewish person went to Gaza? How can, they, why would they go to Gaza? And exactly. Even I wouldn't go to Gaza. Exactly. That's yeah. my point. Yeah, the, so it, it's a dystopia. Who would, but like, I, but I'm just. So it's not just. It's, you know, you're but, you're but, raising but, points about Israel, making out that somehow uh, they're as bad or worse. No, 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 no. But what's but, going on no, there? No, but no, Hamas I'm, I'm, has no, no, ruled no, no. over uh, yes, the Palestinians but, but in the most what? oppressive way imaginable. I, absolutely, too. but you know what? Hamas never claimed that they are the only democracy in the in the in the region. Right. They never claimed that they are secular. They never said that they adopt Western trends. And I they definitely, to, definitely, okay. they did not use that lie in order to carpet bomb a whole country. Okay. Now here, I want to say one example. And I'm going to leave you. All right. Israel, you think that Israel will like, uh, by the way, the whole thing about the Yemeni children, you can find it in the New York Times. It's called like the, uh, the, the lost uh, uh, children of Israel, uh, the forgotten. Uh, but even when Ethiopian people were immigrated to Israel, mm -hmm. Ethiopian Jews, mm -hmm. women then report, 2013, that's not like 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. They reported that they were given against their consent and without their knowledge contraceptive shots so they wouldn't reproduce because they are the wrong color. Israel is, n is a racist, apartheid country that is projecting this shiny example of secularism and democracy for the people so people can accept whatever they do because they look at Palestinians as lesser people. This is the whole point. This is the whole point. And I would like to quote Winston Churchill. He had a quote that say, I don't believe that we have made a great wrong to the Red Indians of America or the black people of Australia because they were replaced by a higher race, a stronger race, a more world wisely race. This is, this is why Queen Rania is criticizing the West. This is why we here said like, where are your values? Because this is the crux of the problem. It's not Hamas, it's not Palestine. I quote, it is people I'm looking at us you. as lesser human beings. Basim, I, I'm I don't dispute the characterization that a lot of the Israel administration look upon Palestinians as lesser people. Otherwise, they wouldn't. They drink. even look at the, the Ethiopian Jews and Yemeni Jews yeah, like I, less. I wouldn't dispute that. Um, I want to quote you mm -hmm. to, to end this. No, why would you end this? Don't end this. We'll be talking for two hours. Why not? At some point we're we have having to end an this. amazing time. We can do another interview. <laughs> well, this one goes big. Um, I think this is a neat way to end it. He said, I actually believe there is a middle ground between everybody and they can meet. I direct my criticism for the extreme of each one of them. That was you, Bassam Yusuf. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. But I don't share your view there can never be peace in this region. Mm -hmm. I, I think there can't be with the current leadership structures in both countries or both places. But I definitely think you've got to be optimistic about peace. You just need to find people I, that I, can, I, I that hope can so. forge it. I hope so. But the reason, listen. I refuse to come on, my sh on your show when your producer first called me for the first interview mm. because I was scared. I was afraid. For me, that was a career suicide. 
because and and I have I, I'm talk, this is even important because you are someone who's always talked about like against cancel culture about like talking speaking your mind out mm -hmm. speaking your mind yes. out. I left Egypt and I came to America the land of the free the home of the brave but I didn't know that there was a fine print said that you cannot speak about Israel mm -hmm. I have issue with that Israel is a foreign country their allies good but you we can't speak about Israel how many people lost their jobs? Even Bella Hadid. Bella Hadid. Bella Hadid. She's she. she Bella. Oh, by the way, Bella. She hasn't, she hasn't lost her job. No, she, no. But she's talked about death threats. She's yeah. talking about like being silenced. Sure. And, uh, by the way, Bella Hadid is with. She's Palestinian. And you know who else? Gigi Hadid sisters. Yeah. I love the Hadid. They are with us. Yeah. Anyway, so. I know them both. They're very nice. People. Yeah, but but the thing is, if if you are that high and you cannot speak about it, yeah. and it's, it's not about it's well, like. you can. You just have to. Have, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. You, you can. I the, mean, I've spoken out about these issues, and you get shot at, not literally, but metaphorically all day long on social media, but that shouldn't stop people from doing it. I'm just like wondering, as an American- You do? As an American, yeah, but like, I, I'm doing now because like the first interview went well. Right. I'm doing that because I want people to see that you can really speak up and not just get cancer, but get rewarded. My career is going fine. Yeah. It's great because I want people to have the courage. But I, why are, we, there should be no limits. I, I'm, I'm, I agree with I, I'm that. kind of like so, so confused as an American citizen, why every American president, can, a presidential candidate, have to go and kiss the hand and bend the knees to APAC? Mm. This is a lobby that works for a, a foreign country interest. Why don't we have like a lobby for Saudi Arabia? It is they're giving us more money. You know the great thing? You can say that here. Yes. You couldn't say it in Egypt. That's why you're living here. Yes, uh, but again, a lot of people feel the burn, the heat, whenever I, they yeah, come down. But if I was an American, I'd be going, oh, all right, Bassem. All right, we'll take the criticism because you can do that in this country. And I'm happy. When you criticize the government in your own country, yeah. they drove you out. Yes, and that's why I came to America, to play the white man's game, to actually to, to, to pass this acquired white privilege to my children. Not, but the problem is- It's not just a country am, of white people. But, but, but here's the problem. And the white man's game, uh, uh, the, uh, the game in America is not a white man's game. It's a game that actually has a democracy and believes in freedom of speech. But there are dog whistles everywhere. You're, you're not going to be put in jail for this interview. Or I can lose my career and I can lose jobs, and you know that. You, you could know in, that. In Egypt, you could. No, here you can In too. Egypt, they arrested here, you. Here you can And too. they threatened you, and, and you would have probably ended up in prison here or you, dead. Here, a lot of people lost their jobs because they spoke up. It depends what they say. Of course, but again... If you're Kanye that, West and that, you spew anti-Semitic no, garbage, no, 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 I'm not, I'm, you're going to lose what you I will never adopt that kind of point of view. But the thing is, there is dog whistles everywhere. Yeah. As I told you at the beginning, you cannot just say it's like anti-Semite, anti-Semite. Sort of, like, I mean, uh, now the, how, how come that the Palestinian flag mm. is outlawed? By the way, it's outlawed in, in Israel. If you raise the Palestinian, you go to jail. And now they're saying like the Palestinian flag is a pro-Hamas. No, it's not a pro-Hamas. Mm. You know, I was, in, I was in doing a comedy show in Arizona, and a guy was like wearing like a, a kofaya, like a scarf. And I took it, and, and I'm not like in hyperbole and like uh -huh. wearing symbols, but I just wanted to because like, why are we, at, uh, are we gonna uh, outlaw colors mm. and flags? That is, that, that, that is absurd. That is not right. I don't, I agree. I don't think you should, <laughs> but you should certainly outlaw Hamas. Regardless. They're already outlaw. I right. mean, I'm not supporting them. Because they're a terror them. group. Yeah. I'm, I, Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. but the people with the power, the people who supposedly have the... And you should, by the way, I will say this, you should be able to criticize the Israeli government without being accused of yes, being anti-Semitic. I have in this interview repeatedly, and I'm not anti-Semitic. I just have a problem with all of what the Israeli government's been doing. I, and I have a problem with how any criticism to Israel by some circles mm. here are considered anti-Semite. This is not but some, fair. But, yeah, but a lot of the people doing it are actually anti-Semitic. Yes, but also a lot of Zionists mm. are against Israel that they hate the Jews. You know, the, it, 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 we've, it, we've discussed that. I want to yeah. end on a happy. Uh, but, but before that, I want to just like say two words about the media, which is, okay. uh, please. Sure. Uh, Mr. Zomlot, the Palestinian yeah. ambassador that you have, uh, this guy lost six members of his family mm. in an Israeli strike. Mm. And when he went on like some British news thing, he sat down and the, and 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 the, the, the lady told him, "It's like we are very sorry for a personal fault. Mm. I'm sure you don't condemn the killing of Israeli civilians." What? Mm. In the same moment, there's another girl like called Yara uh, Aid. She was like on Sky News, mm. and this, and the, the girl was like, "Christ, like I lost 30 members of my family. 17 of them are children. I lost my best friend." And then, the, what do you think would happen if, if, is? I'm, forget about empathy. I what, think a, a lot of people, what about manners? Well, I think you have to start. I've said this repeatedly. You have to start from a place of humanity. 
You have yes. to look at what happened on October the 7th and feel utterly outraged and disgusted for the loss of human life. Yeah. And you also have to feel that for what's happening in Gaza to innocent people. But, but, but and if you don't, if you can't feel both in, for both sets of people, both sets of innocent people being killed, if you can't feel a sense of, of despair and horror over their deaths, you don't have any humanity. Believe me, Pierce. Believe me, Pierce. It's not really about that. There's a deep sentiment in the Middle East, in Arabs, that the West do not look at us as equals. Well, you know what? So That's what I did, I went to the machines. Yeah. And I asked Chad GPT simple questions. Mm -hmm. Do Israelis deserve to be free? And you know what they tell me? Yes, Israelis deserve the right like any other people. And then I asked the same question. Do Palestinians deserve to be free? And you know what they tell me? It is complex. It is a sensitive issue. Well, it's not complex. It's not sensitive. The Palestinian people should be free. Yeah, but and even the machines well, have... Let me finish. The, and they should have exactly the same rights yeah. to freedom and freedom of expression and the way to lead their lives and to water and to power and to yeah. the internet that Israelis have and we have here in America and we have back in my home country of the UK. And I want that for the Palestinian people. We've got to end it there. Okay. Mainly because I've worked up a hell of a hard All right. In two hours of interview, and you have brought your wife's cooking. <laughs> so, uh, okay. so tell me again how I do this. Okay, so basically, you take a piece of this, you, you put it in you, the you, olive oil, yes, which is from the West Bank. Yeah, from the West Bank. And then a little bit of this. Yes. Like that. Yes, yes. This is like amazing oil coming from the olive tree. Uh, this has come from the West Bank. Mm. Since 1967, That's Israel good. have actually uprooted 800,000 mm. olive trees just to. That is absolutely delicious. I know. Please thank your wife for me. Thank you. Wish her all the best and, and her family, mm -hmm. particularly those who are uh, obviously in Gaza. It's been great to see you. Thank you so much. In America. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Let's keep talking. Yes. I honestly think the way through this is people keep talking. Yes. Good thank to you. see you. Thank you so much.